Hey everyone, so I'm here with Jason Anru from uh, Maoist Rebel News. Uh, how are you doing, Jason? Oh, I'm okay. <laughs> so we're going to uh, talk a little what, bit uh, about what, Marxism. What, 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 what time is it where you are? Uh, 1 p.m. 1 p.m.? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, it's 6 a.m. here. Oh, that, uh, that kind of explains why we're a little bit uh, tired. Oh, yeah. No, that's, that's fine. I, I've been up for a few hours. Hmm. What what do you think uh, about cuz I understand you're you're an actual marxist. What do you think about intersectional feminism? Um complete fail. Complete fail, right? Eh? Uh, I find that the the problem is it's like saying oh yeah, you know, this road intersects with this road but nobody has an actual map. Mm-hmm. Okay, that okay, that that didn't really explain it all that clear. Okay. Uh, in Marxism, we, we see it as a series of contradictions, a contradiction between races, contradictions between male and female, and many of those contradictions influence other ones. Like, for example, it'd be fair to say that there are problems between men and women. And it's not, right. just, it's not just white men and white women, and it's black men and black women, etc., so rather than seeing it as a bunch of lines intersecting, they should see it as a bunch of circles, kind of like a Venn diagram. There are, there are contradictions, conflicts, but they also influence other conflicts as well. Yeah. And the point of Marxism is, uh, better, uh, uh, Mao did a better thing on this than Marx did, was to identify the primary contradiction the biggest one overall that influences all the others, eliminate that one. And the other ones will be less, will be less, uh, f- for the lack of a better term, problematic. And then you can begin to unravel each of the little ones. So which one is the biggest contradiction according to Mao? Uh, uh, right now, um, the primary contradiction is imperialism. Once imperialism is solved, then it would be the individual struggles against capitalism in each country. And then after that, it would be taking care of the individual little things like between men and women, between races, etc. Like, but what if like imperialism is the state of man and it, it can't really be crushed? I mean, throughout history, we had empires rise and fall. You know, from the beginning of history, if you look at the world map, you will see that this is the case. Yeah, there have been histories with it, but nothing says that it has to be that way. But one of the things that Marx pointed out with uh, historical materialism was that societies evolved in a certain way by forces that we didn't understand. That's, uh, you know, the whole thing between uh, a ruling class and a subjugated class, etc. And then when one overthrew another, a new type of society would evolve. Marx's point that, that, he's, that he's making is that now we understand that that happens. And now that we know that's how it happens, we can intentionally direct that ourselves. Rather than being uh, slaves to blind forces controlling our destiny, we can now take that destiny in our own hands with the tools necessary that we gain from knowledge. I see. Well, uh, the the way I view it with the intersectional feminism is that uh, they noticed communism, uh, the people at Frankfurt School noticed communism isn't really working in the West because uh, they they had a very strong middle class. So the idea of class struggle wasn't really appealing for people in the United States for it. So they tried Uh, to replace it with... I would actually actually argue different. Hmm. Uh, Going back to what I said before we were on the air about uh, different theoretical contributions to, to best explain the position I have. Uh, there's, you know, Marx who laid down what Marxism is, then Lenin who created the theory of imperialism. And then Mao came along with uh, stuff like primary and secondary contradiction and uh, basically acknowledging, Hey, you know, revolutions never happened in the advanced industrialized countries like Marx predicted. In fact, it was always the more backward countries that revolution took place. Now, uh, that would be the the three primary stages or the, or the three heads. Like, you know, you've seen the heads of the three guys all in a row kind of thing. Yeah. I am a subscriber to what we call the fourth stage. Uh, that is called... The problem is that there's no full unified theory on how it is. There's no tr- fully formed ism. 
because no one has really formulated it yet because it's still relatively new. Uh, for the lack of a better term, third worldism. Essentially, our position is that the first world is bought off with the spoils of imperialism to the point where they don't have a revolutionary potential. And in fact, in many cases, uh, an equitable distribution of wealth across the world would be bringing down most of the first world. So they have no interest in revolution, thus they don't really care about it. That's why you get a lot of these, you know, so-called socialists that are just, you know, oh, fat, 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 Bernie Sanders. Because they, yeah, don't, I mean, they don't really want a revolution because they know what a revolution would entail. I think the best way to put it is like this. Walk up to a $70,000 a year union construction worker and say, hey, man, here's a gun. We're going to go be guerrilla fighters. So give up both your cars, your house, your pension, and he's yeah. going to laugh in your face. Yeah, you seem to have more common sense than most of the socialists I know, because most of the socialists are like, yeah, America is, uh, an uh, you know, doing this imperialist thing and they're living in the first world. And they're basically trying to shame, I guess, the people of America to start a revolution against their own nation so that they, they distribute the wealth to other people. So it's like, OK, you go die on the street so that your kids will live poorly. Uh, and this is what I think a lot of Antifa are trying to push for. Yeah, the problem with, with Antifa is that while they are certainly well-meaning and their heart is in the right place, they really don't have a scientific understanding of how to bring about revolution, which is a general problem that anarchists have. It's just state bad, smash state, everything will be fine. Well, I, I don't know if they're well-meaning when they use like bicycle locks to crack people's skulls. You know, I, I mean, I'm watching that. But I, I'm saying from from the perspective of building revolution. Okay, right. Well, um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know the the communist manifesto. I I've read it recently, and I think it's a little bit outdated because the criticism towards capitalism is a capitalism that we don't have today. Most capitalist nations aren't fully capitalist. They have integrated a lot of social programs and safety nets and welfare. Oh yeah, the basically the world's changed since eighteen forty eight. <clears throat> oh no shit. <laughs> Yeah, but, but the thing is, like, a lot of people still bring up, like, Marx's criticism for capitalism. They still talk about factories. And, like, well, most factories are automated at the moment. You know, people work in offices at Google and Facebook. It's... Um, that's part of one of, the, one of the problems. There is an evolution of capitalism. That's why we have different theoretical stages. The problem is everybody's still stuck on the second stage. Like they're not even they're not even really moving into the third stage of Maoism. People claim to be Leninists, they claim to be Maoists, but to be really honest, they don't know what they're talking about. They're not really yeah. making any sense. I mean, it, it doesn't take a goddamn genius to realize that you know the world is not the same as it was in 1848. Now, Marx did uh, predict that there would be eventually in the future concessions that could be given to the workers, uh, universal health care, uh, you know, welfare programs, etc. The problem is that he didn't get a chance to f fully write up all of this. There was supposed to be. There's the, 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 the three volumes of Capital. There's actually four. Uh, a lot of people don't know that there was a fourth one. The fourth one, he never actually finished. Uh, Engels was going to do it, but Engels died before he did it. And uh, a guy whose name I can't remember came along and did it. But there were supposed to be six books. Marx never finished the first one. There was supposed to be a whole series of going into absolutely everything that he never got around to because he died before he could finish it. I never knew about that, though. Yeah, that's a lot of Marxists don't don't even know that there was there was like you could find you can go to Marxist.org the, the the archive and you could see how he had planned it all out. There was going to be a whole huge thing, uh, state investment, a whole ton of stuff, but he, he never got to finish it because he died. Hmm. So someone in the chat said, uh, "Kick V." <laughs> that's a meme. Also from Australia, I'd say having a balanced system suits as humans require balance. Too often, people go to the extreme or the other. I would say that uh, the idea of balance is is pretty much a fallacy in itself, because there's it's 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 that very uh, liberalish position where, oh, like if we just have oh, Jesus Christ, a fucking roommate, <laughs> the um. If we just balance everything, everything will be okay. 
but it's kind of an assumption. Oh, uh, we'll, we'll um, just take the middle. Usually, it's um. Usually, it's used by a lot of people who don't want, who don't stand pretty firmly on one particular position or another. No, oh no. Let me give you an example, right? Um, you get people who say like the alt right, and they say deport everyone that's non-white from the country. And then you have the opposite people like Antifa who say no borders. And the position in the middle would be, well, let's just deport the illegals and keep the citizens in. I mean, th this would be considered the centrist position. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you're a fence sitter, you need to take a side. Yes, to which I would answer, the problem is that uh, it's not being looked at in the right context. Antifa is not really, is not just saying no borders. They're talking about an entirely different order of society where borders wouldn't be needed. The problem is Antifa is really, really bad at expressing ideas. And a big part of that is I, I wonder how much they even understand. Like to them, it's it's a matter of this is bad, get rid of it. But they don't understand how to go about building the alternative. Antifa's primary focus is smashing the order they don't want. And then somehow the, the order they do want will just magically come into place. Well, well that, the, the that, way that's I not how it. that works. I think Antifa would chimp out if America would send tanks over the Mexican border and say that, well, there is no border here, you know. <laughs> well, or for instance, send an FBI strike team to deal with the cartels in Mexico. You know, of course, they would protest against that. So it's only no borders when it's against America, not when it's for, you know. Because I, that with that, it depends on who's the victim and yeah. who's the who's the aggressor. I mean, that's like that's like saying uh, all violence is bad. Well, no, self-defense isn't bad. I mean, no rational person is going to say that you're not allowed to defend yourself. But when you say all violence is bad, that's kind of essentially what you're saying. Well, it's cultural Marxism. I don't know if you agree with the term or not, but it's basically the idea of replacing the class struggle between the bourgeoisie and the uh, working class with the oppressor and the oppressed. You know, you now have like the majority, whatever that is, is oppressing the minority. So... Uh, now the minority needs to speak up. Now the minority needs to have a say. Now, I think the problem is that I've heard so many different definitions of what cultural Marxism is. Intersectional feminism. I think everyone would agree. Actually, it, let, let, let's go by the one that you just gave. Yeah. Now, um, I would say in that case, you're probably right. Marxism is a science of class struggle. Once you abandon class struggle you're not doing Marxism anymore. Now, if you're like um, a very left-leaning liberal, okay, I, you know, you know that's, that, that, that's what you do, I understand. <laughs> but if you're supposed to be a Marxist, you're not doing it right. No, uh, I know, but, but you know what they do? I, I don't know if you read Bell Hooks, for instance, or if you read Marcuse. They treat women as a class, like they treat black people as a class. Um... And then they try to shoehorn that in, to, to, to push that in into the Marxist view. So they will try to, yeah, they, they, they treat like there's an interest of all women. Like if you listen to Anita Sarkeesian speak, she's like, feminism isn't what the individual woman wants. Like every woman needs to do her part for feminism as a I whole. Mean, as that's, a a, that's a liberal view. That's not a Marxist view. The problem is you, you can't just shoehorn that into Marxism. It's, it's a progressive view, but yeah. not a liberal. Oh, progressive, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Because, I mean, that's definitely, Marxism is class. You can't just read, class is based on a socioeconomic status. And a lot of them have to complain, oh, that's economic reductionism. No, that's what it is. It's, it's a theory of class struggle. Now, those class struggles taken to a particular stage can deal with those other problems, including misogyny, etc. But you cannot just simply take you know, this kind of theory and just shoehorn it into Marxism. That doesn't work. Like, you, you can't just say, here's a science, but we're going to try to force this thing to fit in there anyway, even though it doesn't really have anything to do with it. It, it yeah, doesn't work. This is why they always, this is why this, this idea of Kant, this, this, uh, this idea of Marxism, uh, with all these other things shoehorned into it, are a complete failure. Why they never accomplish anything. They never get the goal done. 
um, because they're abandoning revolutionary science to just ram in things that they do like. It does not take a genius to figure out that in over a hundred years, a century of socialist struggle in the U.S. has accomplished dick. It's a never-ending struggle. I mean, I'm looking at uh, certain Facebook groups that get co-opted by this ideology, and eventually they start banning everyone. They they get into these purity spirals, and then you have like only women there, and the women are like, "Well, I'm a black woman, and I I have I'm more oppressed than you, so you need to be banned now." And then it's like, "Oh, we're both black women, but I'm black and lesbian, so therefore I'm more oppressed, and you need to get Oppression banned now." Olympics. Yeah, and it's just this never-ending struggle that, as you say, don't accomplish anything. But here's an interesting thing from uh, the chat. Stop treating people as classes and start treating them how they can benefit their own life. What, what would you say about that? That's a kind of a, a reductionist view. Um, the problem is that if you just look at it simply in those terms, you're not really organizing society. But it, to, to look at it that way is just reaffirming the system that we already have. Like if it's yeah, just every person just go off and do whatever they want, then those actions will contradict other actions and lead to problems like rich and poor, etc. Someone said uh, communism is not failing. The population are uh, from a super chat. Isn't, isn't what? Communism is not failing. The population are. So it's, it's not it's not the ideology is the people. Um, I would I would tend to agree with that. Uh, the problem is people aren't. They're, they're people who claim to be Marxists aren't doing Marxism. They're, yeah, I would they're, they're just doing today. progressive sh shit. Progressive shit. <laughs> you know, it, it's it interesting. Is. They, they don't even want to talk about the progressive shit. I've been trying to get a progressive on my channel for, I believe, three years now to have a discussion like I'm having with you. You know, I want to talk about affirmative action. I want to talk about um, why they view representation is important. They don't want to. They, they don't want to come here and, and have this conversation. And I think they know their ideology is bad. I, I think it's a lot of people are very weak on theory. And then once you put them into a position where they would then have to go in depth into it. Uh, sorry, not uh, interested. Hmm? I, I think they know that they know their theory is weak. Yeah. Or they just may not even know it. I, I think it can be done simply as, as simple as, I think it's as simple as this. We want equality inside of capitalism. I have no idea how that's supposed to work. Capitalism is a whole system predicated on their opposing equality. But somehow there's going to be equality inside of it. Well, you have right? equality under the law. Yeah, but that doesn't, it doesn't really manifest itself. That's like a difference between social and structural. There will never be equality under capitalism. Capitalism abhors the idea of equality. Yeah, I, I abhor the idea of equality as well. So, I mean, to expect it to happen, in, expecting equality in a system predicated on inequality is foolish. It's not going to happen. No, I mean, yeah, but most people, when they say equality, and I think in the first world, if you use this term, will expect equality under the law. You know, justice is blind and, and that kind of thing, which which I agree. But when you say equality, if I go to work and I'm able to work more, let's say I'm a construction worker, right? And, and I have the physique to, to be better at constructing than other people. I, I'm able to do in one hour what other people do in a half an hour. Um, why exactly shouldn't I get the chance to be promoted or get extra pay? Because uh, I'm doing well, more work than I someone else. That those, that's two different things. Uh... Uh, promotion or payer to like two two different things, but uh, let's stick with pay because that's generally the the idea. Yeah. There's there's a belief that uh, if you if you don't get if the, if you don't get a pay that kind of thing, then people won't work. I would think that in a very real way, when it comes to manual labor, that's really not true. I mean, I've seen, you know, people do more work than others and they get paid the same hourly wage. I mean, yeah. even even when we take socialist societies where they did kind of do that uh, in socialist society, it's not each according to his own need, but each according to his work. It's not the same thing as communism. But I would say that there really is no people just saying, oh, well, I'm not going to do more 
just because I get the same wage as somebody else. I mean, generally speaking, you don't have a choice. You don't take, you know, uh, I, I, you don't walk up your boss and say, yeah, well, I'm faster than this asshole here, so I want more money. Boss is going to laugh in your face. Yeah, of course. But the, the thing is, um, why I think communism is an utopia, and most people, I, I think even Peter Kropotkin, if I get his name right, he also said in his book that's an utopia. Uh, uh, I, I would say that I'm not... 100 percent familiar with uh kropotkin he, he he wrote the conquest of bread oh yeah the robert conquest of bread yeah well but basically uh, the system uh ban banks on the fact that everyone is going to go to work and is going to work as hard as possible and when they're going to go to the store they're going to only take what they need they're not going to take any more uh, and you're expecting people to follow these important guidelines. And, and if you have only a couple of people that are lazy and they're just going to do the minimum that's required, you know, not, not, not in order to get fired, but at the same time, they don't want to excel either. And when it goes into the story, they're going to take more than what they need. Uh, they will set a very bad example for other people and other people are going to do the same, which is enough to, to get the system to have major problems. I think that his um, his statement there relies on some misinformation. Like, th there's not going to be a case where somebody just walks into a store and just takes whatever they want. I mean, there's obviously going to be someone behind the counter saying, you know, you don't need – this is – you know, you can't just walk out of here with all of it and be an asshole. They're going to stop you from doing it. Yeah, we, we actually had that in Communist Romania. We had rationing. So, for instance, when there were bananas being uh, sold, like a lot of people came there because they were really rare. And even if you had money to purchase, like, I don't know, uh, 10 kilograms of bananas, they would only give you, like, five. So what people would do is they would get their family members there. Um, they would get, like, four or five kids, and they were far from the same family, and each one would get bananas, right? But And the family as a whole would, would just have more than other people did just because they stood in line in the queue, and people didn't know that they were cheating the system. Yeah, that's kind of a dick move. I mean, you're you're. It's not going to be perfection, and it's not gonna ha it's not gonna happen right away. Marx does speak uh, about the transformation of human consciousness, the transformation of human nature. Uh, human beings, I don't believe, are born inherently good or born inherently bad. We're just born. Yeah, I, I and, would and, agree with that. And we're largely a product of our system. People felt that the feudal order was natural and this is the way uh, people would be it's normal to just do whatever the king said because i don't know jesus whatever i i think there is some truth to it like if you put 10 men in a group and make them go through a labyrinth they will establish a hierarchy with the guy that decides which way to go like if, if you were to place me with 10 other doctors and you would give us a project you know the doctor that seems to know more about medicine than everyone else is going to uh, be the one that people look up to. Well, I mean, yeah, that's just common sense that the person with more knowledge would be more reliable. Yeah, and, and I, mean, I think hierarchy is not is not something that it, it's based on feudalism or capitalism. It's just a natural state of man. People but do I would want say, how do, you how do you define like hierarchy? Are you saying like a guy who holds an office or just? somebody that people look up to because I think that's well it depends no, from, from what I notice is the person that's cracking the whip the one that's in the imminent danger because if it's just a, a totalitarian person that uses brute force in order to subjugate others eventually the others are going to rise up and take him down but you also have the normal type of hierarchy where people just choose someone they they admire and they will just follow that person they they will listen to what that person says out of their own will without any whip being cracked so, yeah, I, I would definitely agree with you there. Um, another super chat. I think a lot of people are more focused on their day-to-day -day life to, to be concerned with theories. So it's easy to understand why they don't follow it. Oh, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, mm -hmm. That's one of the problems that uh, in uh, my uh, – the theoretical stage of Marxism, I believe in, that in terms of first world people, they can go <clears throat> their day-to-day -day without caring about it. You know, it's not a problem. It's not something that affects their lives to a degree that's enough for them to even think about. Yeah. And this is mostly a social piece that has been bought off by uh, super exploitation of the third world. When you get you get people in the third world, they're more ideologically motivated. They're 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 better understanding about the ideologies that they have, etc. Because 
of their of their condition they understand like like it doesn't take a genius to realize that the poorest people of the world are the ones that have turned to revolution because ideology becomes more important to them it becomes more of a focus towards their their consciousness because they essentially they have to Whereas in the first world, you can just basically, yeah, you know, I, I don't really care. You know, I just want to go to work, etc. I, I would really like to see a debate against the alt-right, because that's a point, I guess, very few people brought. Um, that poor people are more into ideology, I guess. This is why you notice that poor people are more into religion. But uh, let, let's talk a little bit about the third world. I mean, there's a, a white genocide going right now in South Africa. I believe the South African government just released a press statement saying... Uh, we're not going to kill white people yet. And I'm like, oh, okay, That's if, if it's not yet. But they are talking about uh, taking the lands and taking the property of white farmers and um, not giving them any sort of compensation in return. Uh, the police turns a blind eye when white people in Africa are being killed. Um, why, well, I, don't, I don't know if the police are turning a blind eye to that. There's a lot of people that are coming up and they're they're talking about it. Uh, I, I could give you a website if you want, but the, the the issue is they want socialism, right? And they had that in Zimbabwe as well. Like they, I've they, never seen any evidence to suggest they want socialism in South Africa. In Zimbabwe, wasn't even socialist. Okay, well, what do you think they want? Like, because because it's definitely not capitalism, and I don't think it's yeah, it, it uh, was capitalism with a lot of state intervention. Like, I could say Mugabe fucked up a lot of things. Man, uh, he definitely did. And yeah. Some of it was his fault. Some of it wasn't his fault. The, the way I feel it um, in Zimbabwe, they got rid of white farmers for you know historical grievances. Basically, it's like the the whites are the colonizers and stuff like that. And the thing with farmers is that they pass their knowledge on how to farm from generation to generation. So the new farmers didn't have that knowledge. It caused massive starvations and famine in Zimbabwe. And then the Zimbabwean um, uh, dictator was asking white people to come back. Yeah, and they're trying uh, to do the same in South Africa. That's largely misunderstood. Now, uh, I'm not saying there wasn't some shortage of knowledge. I would say it's a case of most of the economy for Zimbabwe was export. Once Mugabe took over and expropriated the land from whites, etc., the the countries that they exported to, which was mainly the UK blocked it well, so now it. you didn't have any money coming in so you couldn't really run those farms if you weren't making a profit but for zimbabwe they they are revolutionary marxist leninist and i think you're a little bit of a no, purist they're, they're when not. it comes to what socialism is i mean they're socialists like in venezuela in the, ideology venezuela isn't socialist it's social democratic i i get what you're saying it's because it's not not enough people died to become fully socialist yet I mean, no, it's I not don't think that's the case. I don't think they even mm -hmm. have a desire to make it socialist. They're pushing social democracy. The means of production are still in the hands of the capitalist class. You just have a state that's highly intervening in it. It's social democracy. They could go socialist if they wanted to, but they're not doing it. It's, it's I this, think they're... As the, the more as socialist the means they go, the, the more white, the, the more capitalist flight they get, and the more poor their nation becomes. So I think that's what's stopping them from going full socialist. But no, I mean, I, I think it's their fault for not going socialist. They keep leaving the means of production in the hands of the capitalist class. You cannot claim to be socialist when the capitalist class has the means of production. I mean, you, well, you, you they're can lie your ass off. They're appropriating property left and right. There's actually this uh, thing on, uh, I believe it was BBC News, this article that I read where the dictator just goes into a, um, a shop that was making boots for people. And he's like, yeah, you got two hours to evacuate this building. It's like, why? Because I want it. And then he leaves. Well, and when you do things like that. That's not what happened in Venezuela. Basically, what happened was uh, I'll they would find say, the they, "No, no, no." I, 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 so what, what happened was they said, "Oh, we can't function because the government thing. We can't run. We don't have money." So the government said, "Okay, well, screw you." They took the they took the factory, handed it over to the workers, and then gave them a budget to operate. Hmm. And how did that work out? That's working on pretty fine. Mm. It's when I mean, they the start to refuse to produce that they usually step in and do that. The way I view it, it's uh, socialism in progress. Would you call that an accurate definition? No. Okay. If they're trying to, tr if, if this really is 
them trying to move towards socialism, they're doing it wrong. Well, okay. Um, here's an interesting question. They Would could be, be they could be socialists and aren't doing it right. Because they have a whole separate theory called 21st century socialism, and it's, 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 well, to be frankly, it's a load of crap. It's just social well, democracy. This, this is what a lot of people want me to ask you right now. Would, would you be able to name a country that you consider socialist throughout the history of mankind? Give it as an example, for instance. Uh, the Soviet Union was socialist. Uh, revolutionary China was socialist. It's not, not today, but it, it was in the past. Uh, the DPRK was socialist. I don't really consider the, C the DPRK to be socialist anymore, but there is there's there's still some debate over that. Cuba, I would say, probably isn't socialist anymore. I mean, w would you consider these countries as examples to follow? Not today, but like like the Soviet Union, yes, not Russia today. I mean, I, I lived under the Iron Curtain, and I, I'm telling you, it was no fun. Well, I didn't say it was going to be easy. <laughs> well, it's, uh, the, the thing that I noticed is that you managed to take down the hierarchy, right? Because everyone was equal, theoretically. But what happens, you create a new aristocracy class. Like, you, you had the inner party members that... Y the, the idea of power corrupts absolutely is definitely applied here. You know, maybe they had good intentions, or maybe they they were just selected because of their ideology. But de facto, they did became the new aristocracy within. Oh, the... absolutely! That's the thing. That's one of the things Mao criticized the Soviet Union for was uh, allowing the Communist Party to become the new ruling class. Uh, that was <coughs> Mao's statement. Was that you th at the time? it was believed that once you got rid of the capitalists, there would be no more ruling class. And then Mao learned from the, uh, from the experience of the Soviet Union, well, you no, know, that that's really not true, that the party itself can become a ruling class. And he wrote against that, he criticized Stalin for it, and took a lot of shit for saying it, etc. Uh, some other super chat. You you must hate them because they're like the, the worst thing capitalism has uh, to offer, right? No, I just, I, all I see is Google Hangout. <laughs> oh, uh, well, there, there are super chats coming. Get it? Is if you see a homeless person in cold weather, give them a break. Um, actually, we do have a lot of programs. Like hospitals are forced to to take homeless people in during the cold weather. Churches are uh, also doing it in my country, at least. Uh, and you also have. Um, other programs like in France, for instance, the ex, uh, extra food from supermarkets have to go to homeless people's shelter and so on, I, which is why, you know, we agree that the capitalism Marx um, complained about. I'm, I'm sorry, can you, can you hold on? I really have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> okay, I'm really sorry. Right. Hold on. Yeah, uh, if you guys have any more questions that uh, you'd like me to ask him, I, I will do so. Um, I think he's an interesting chap because um, he's not he's not like the the progressive type of crazy like that there is something intellectual to discuss. Uh, I disagree with the um, assessment of Venezuela not being socialist. I mean, I, I can see his point, but I'm not I'm not a, a purist when it comes to it, right? If uh, also like uh, Zimbabwe, I think is socialist. <laughs> what is his favorite anime? Oh, I'll, I'll actually ask him about the uh, views of the USSR and the EU. Yeah, he's an intellectual. Like, he knows Marxism. I, I disagree with Marxism as a whole and as an ideology, but he does know... Uh, he, he does understand the literature behind his idea. So, yeah, I would call him an intellectual. <laughs> Ask him about Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, oh, I missed the super chat. Um, I believe it was like, get meat hooks to kill communists. It's like, okay, but dude, I'm trying to be nice. It's not cool, bro. It's not cool. Ask him what he thinks about capitalism having raised the welfare wealth of the third world like nothing else ever before. 
Uh, I don't think I have the statistics at hand to ask him this question. Like if anyone, if anyone can send me the statistics, I will. <laughs> ask me if he's a Jew. Ah, I got the statistics. Okay, so I'll I'll discuss the statistics with him. V, what happened to Sargon? I don't know, man. I really don't know. Uh, his uh, his Google account was taken down. He's uh, working to find out what went wrong. It, it happened when we were playing the end. Why are people hungry in Venezuela? Well, he, he doesn't think that Venezuela is socialist. Um, but don't worry. I, I have uh, a way of how going around that and asking... Um, him an interesting question when he comes back. So he considers the Soviet Union and China socialists. Uh, what's his excuse for the millions of murders? I'll, I'll ask him that. I think he probably has an answer because that's the question that most people will ask. It's never socialism, especially when it failed. Well, he, he did provide an interesting thing. He said that China and the USSR were socialists and they failed. So. I guess it's not um, it's not accurate to point this on him. And V, you should have prepared for this. Um, well, I, I just want to have a, a nice conversation. If you guys want to hear his ideology, you can go on his channel. I, I wasn't really interested in a debate or anything. It's just... Um, just wanted to, to show people <clears throat> what the Marxist actually thinks compared to what the progressive thinks. And I think they're, they're kind of different. I mean, he doesn't like Antifa, and I don't like it either, so there's a clean distinction. Ask him about Pinochet. <laughs> I don't think he likes Pinochet. Marx was pro-democracy. I mean, yeah, I guess, like, if, if you reach that level of communism where everyone is equal, then, yeah, decisions will be taken between the people. Didn't he also say that the USSR was a good model to follow? Yeah, I want to ask him what he thinks about the EU, because I think the EU takes a lot of um, models from the USSR. Let's ask him why China and Russia are different from Venezuela. That's actually a good question. I wasn't interested in a debate. Also, that's where Sargon was getting it from. Well, no, Sargon actually agreed to a debate. I, I just want to have a conversation. Okay, I'm back. Yeah, uh, so I noticed this interesting thing. The chat doesn't automatically despise you, which is uh, quite uh, an interesting thing to see. Um, I think uh, you made some reasonable points. So, yeah, they, they asked me to, to ask you what do you think about Pinochet. Pinochet? Yeah. Yeah, um, actually... Aside from him being an asshole and a hypocrite. Okay. Um, uh, someone else asked me, and this is actually an interesting question. Um, with the rise of capitalism, you see massive growth in wealth, even in the third world, compared to how it used to be. Um, would you not be able to point that capitalism is actually improving the, the poverty line throughout the world? I would say, yeah, it is a, a, an increase. There's, there's no doubt. But that increase is limited. 
so so basically you think if more people would go for socialism it would grow even faster than it's currently growing ours would go down but theirs would go up well isn't that in the interest of everyone that is in ours not to to have its wealth going down i mean the way i view it most people care about themselves and their family and their children so you're that you is, would basically that is the idea that's pushed by capitalism that that my personal interests are the only one that matter and then other people push their own personal interests and then whatever happens is called the result of the market well, I think it's biological. Like, if it's my child, I will care about my child, regardless of what the state has yeah. to say about it. But there's no inherent thing that says, I don't care about anybody else. Of course, you're going to care about your own child more. But there's this idea that you will you won't care about anyone else. It's just not true. Yeah, but the thing is, if my child will do worse on the betterment of someone else that I don't even know, like, why would I ask for that? Oh, well, that's the thing. That's one of the reasons why the first world is not revolutionary. If somebody can sit, sit there and say, okay, yeah, the system creates people who live on less than $2 a day and, you know, <coughs> X number of children die during childbirth because of poverty. But if we did anything about that, my child wouldn't make as much money. Eh, fuck you. Well, it's not, it's not that. It's mostly if my nation does well, I do well by extent, right? And if my nation does poorly, then there's going to be less jobs. The, the welfare state is going to suffer, so on and so forth. So the question would be, why would I advocate for those things to happen um, when, you know, I'm living a comfortable life, my family is living a comfortable life, and the people that I know closer to me are doing well? The problem is that the, the problem with the first world is that it plunders the third world to get a lot of that wealth. Yeah, I, I agree. I think China is plundering Africa right now. Yes, it um, is. Saudi Arabia. Yeah, China, it basically is an imperialist power. Yeah. There, there, yeah, I think that there will always be an imperialist power in the world. Like, if America steps down, I would hate to see China as the world hegemon. Because America, I think, shows a lot of restraint. Well, for, for the world you hegemon. might want to ask the people in the Middle East that. Well, that, that is true. But you might want to ask the people in the Middle East how it was when Russia was there. Versus how it is when the Americans are there. Well, when the Russians were there, it's like, oh, we, we have some uh, terrorists and they would just level entire uh, villages. With the Americans, they, they go into the village, oh, there's some men come up from the mountains and killed a bunch of American soldiers and now they're back in the mountain. We don't know anything. And the Americans are like, ah, okay. Um, I mean, it, it's still an imperialist power, don't get me wrong, but it shows a lot of restraint compared to other imperialist power throughout history. I really don't think it does. Uh, well, Sorry, okay. It's, it's killed to, you know, tens of millions of people. Let, let me rephrase that. Which other imperialist power, either than America, did less damage than the Americans? Um, if you you want to go by just pure numbers, I would say the Soviet Union. The later years of the Soviet Union, when it was social imperialist, uh, did less damage. I think they were so brutal that people were afraid to rise up. So maybe you'd have a point when you look at the numbers. Like if you if you go with the culture of terror and you you make the worst example out of some people, then maybe other people will refuse to rise up. So well, then I, I've, I've seen Afghanistan under the Soviets and I've seen it under the U.S. Well, is it under the U.S. or is it more under like theocratic guerrilla fighters right now, um, which are supported by the U.S.? Don't get me wrong, because it's a proxy war. But at the end of the day, it's um, like, like the Russians were having boots on the ground and the U.S. are doing it through via proxy. I'd say the U.S. Army is still taking a great deal there. They're trying to shift most of the combat thing over there, but it's still a, a U.S. rule place. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with it. I, I think, well, I, I don't think it's rule de facto. I think it's under the United States sphere of influence, to put it better way. Isn't that kind of the same thing? Um, well, it, it depends, I guess, because when... When you're like Romania is under the U.S. sphere of influence, uh, we wanted to impeach our president and uh, the United States ambassador came over and said no. So basically, you have a freedom of how you want to govern yourself until a point. And when you reach that point, then the colonial power steps in. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. You can there's only so much you're allowed to do. But basically, I would rather be under the U.S. than China or I would rather be under the U.S. than Russia. That's my point. Oh, yeah, to each his own. All right. Um, well, let's see what else uh, is there to... Oh, uh, people said about the USSR. Um, and I read this article by a person who escaped the Gulag. And he complains the Europe... He compares the European Union to the USSR when it comes to how it governs itself. 
Would you consider that to be an accurate uh, assessment? Mm, no. Like, how is it the same? Well, it's not democratic for once. I guess the, the, the council... The Union is democratic. Well, it's the, the laws well, are not made by the European... Yeah, the, the, the laws aren't made by the European Parliament. They're made up by the European Council. Yeah, by people who are elected to appoint certain individuals to positions. I mean, it is, it's as democratic as, you know, any, you know, capitalist country is. And isn't, it wasn't the same with the USSR? Like, you wouldn't be able to elect the people who actually made the laws. They were appointed. Um, I would say a lot of the people uh, were elected. But as time went on, it definitely became less democratic. I think that's that's pretty obvious. Someone took uh, offense in me saying that America is a colonial power. Um, I want to correct uh, that. Uh, I meant cultural, right? And in, in, in the sense of a culture, because everything Romanians do is almost American. Like we play American video games, watch American movies, listen to American music, read American books. And if America says something, most Romanians will say, well, it's the Americans. Clearly, they know what it's up because they're, they're such an amazing country. Uh, and when our president does something stupid and we want to impeach him, America steps in and says no. So, yeah, we are under the influence of America. Um, tell this Marxist gentleman <laughs> that he be clubbed by nationalists such as me. Traditionalism is the future. No Marxist or communist can deny that. Um, oh, yeah, wow. Well, <laughs> someone's going to kick my ass over the Internet, okay. Uh, well, it's it's this uh, idea that's going on between globalism and nationalism. Oh, yeah? Well, if I was on the street, I'd kick your ass. <laughs> Socialism in the future. So there. <laughs> Appeal to force. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I guess, uh, w which side do you take in the, the current conflict that I view as globalism versus uh, nationalism? Like, you have Hungary that's I, taking a stand against the EU, for instance. I think it depends on what you consider globalism to be. I consider globalism to be an integration of the of the the economies of of the world like uh cross markets uh companies having businesses in different countries etc like like an integration of the global market i, w I would call that globalization well um the the reason and i'm against the uh... The, the idea of globalization is that people in America, for instance, pay taxes to get certain benefits like welfare, you know, the, the, the safety net and infrastructure and something else. And then when people from the outside are coming in without paying into the system, they expect the same benefits. And I don't find that to be fair. Well, I would say that's a uh, I mean, yeah, you could say that, but you're only paying benefits into a system that I wouldn't support anyway or I, I don't support anyway. So. What is okay. Matter? So, like, which aspects of the welfare would you say? Well, you're I mean, support? it's welfare under capitalism, and I don't want capitalism there anyway. So, what does it matter? Oh, I see. Well, uh, as for what you said with the economy being, I think that's what the EU is trying to do. It's trying to get all of Europe uh, to have intermarkets and, and exchange and trade between nations. But the yeah. problem is, I yeah, that there is a fundamental problem here. Uh, the economy in Romania is really low. So, for instance, to go to med school, you don't have to pay that much. Let's say I'm just pulling it out of my ass because I, I got a, um, a scholarship for good grades. But let's say it's like $10,000 to go through med school right, in Romania. And that's six years of medicine. While in Britain, it takes over 20,000 uh, pounds. So when a Romanian doctor can just go throughout uh, the Europe without any sort of checks, right? His diploma is being recognized. Uh, he doesn't have any bank loans. He doesn't have any of these burdens. He can just become a doctor in Britain and work for less. While a British citizen who wants to become a doctor, he has loans, he, he's got responsibilities, and he's not going to be able to work for as less as a Romanian. So Romania is losing brain power because a lot of doctors are going to other nations, while Britain is gaining... Um, is uh, unable to provide jobs for its own people. Yeah, that's definitely an effect of a rich country and poor country. Like, that's an, un un an unequal society. Like, I wouldn't advocate that. I would just say, if someone wants to be a doctor, let them go to school and not carry a debt, period. Hmm. Well, okay, I put you on the spot a lot asking you about your ideology. Do, do you no, want to ask fine. me anything about um, the way I view the world? Yeah. No, not not particularly. I, I think I mean, I've gotten a pretty good clue from the conversation. 
Okay. Um, well, I mean, <laughs> would you would you classify me as a right winger or left leaner? Um, technically, you would be considered a right winger. Really? Like, oh, like right of center, or or okay. center or right of center. I, I I'm happy with that. I, I consider myself a left leaning person, but um, I, I suppose. Um, well, it, it's been really nice talking to you, mate. Um, I think. I think even the chat um, reacted more positively to you than other people I had on. No, oh, that's good. So uh, I'll put your channel into the description. Is there the, any... The, the, yeah, the is problems there... with a lot of Marxists, they don't know Marxist theory as much as they think they do. This is what I like to get from the conversation, is that um, an actual Marxist, and I, and I do consider you to be an actual Marxist because uh, it, it's obvious you learned your shit. Yeah. Um, and it's... You, you don't really like the progressives. Because this is what I said on, in a previous video. Uh, everyone that's a progressive would just be placed under a wall and be shot in communist Romania. Like, they, they wouldn't tolerate this ideology at all. I, th I think it, it depends. There are some progressive ideas that are just fine and some that are batshit stupid. I mean, okay, let's take the idea of... Um... Equality between men and women. I'm okay with that. But when you start going well, it, this, it depends. This... Like, are, are you saying under the law, or are you saying that men and women should be a hundred percent equal in anything? Uh, equal pay for equal work. Yeah. But well, do you, do you want to talk about the wage gap or wage gap? Um, I mean, there is a wage gap, but I mean, as that wage gap exists under capitalism, and I want capitalism dead anyway, what does it matter? Yeah, but if you if you look at how they did it, it's it's not the way an, an economist would actually look at the wage gap. I mean, they, yeah, they're looking like, at women and men overall, right? To, and it's like, like to me, it's the gap between men and women is less relevant than the gap between the first and the third world. I see. So, so you're more like, uh, let, let me see if I get your position correctly. You're more concerned about the third world, uh, and you want it to do better, even if it's at the expense of the first world. To put it uh, to to put it in the the simplest terms possible, the first world is not revolutionary because of its exploitation of the third world that buys a better living standard for its people. Thus, it is up to the third world to release itself from the shackles of the of the first world, and they can develop themselves. They'll ha they'll have their own revolutions, etc. And the resulting crash in the first world that because it no longer has its a pool of cheap resources to exploit will eventually end up going into a crisis. And it is theoretically in that crisis, people will acknowledge their class interests and then carry out revolution in those countries. Yeah, that's, that's a view I've never heard. I mean, if I look at Romania, for instance, most of our forests are being taken down by Austria, right? And uh, Romania is losing at this. Obviously, there's going to be landslides. There's going to be uh, definitely meteorological conditions affected by the fact that we're going to be left without forests. I mean, it's massive deforestation. It's not, it's not just, you know. Uh, so the reason this is happening is because of corruption. It's because the people in charge um, have deals with Austrian companies. And they're like, yeah, we're going to give you some money. You just turn a blind eye while we do this. Uh, so... I, I kind of see what you mean in a way that it, it is predatory, but the reason it is predatory is because the third world, or in my case, the second world, allows it uh, be, due to the corruption that exists in the people in they charge. Set up, they set up governments that are friendly to those interests. And when you try to release yourself from that, you end up being attacked. I, I would say that, well, it's in our case, when we try to release ourselves from that, the, the American uh, ambassador came in and the European Union, Angela Merkel and... Uh, uh, what what's his name? Uh, Yonker also stepped in and said that yeah no you're not allowed to, to do this you're not allowed to impeach our president. Now if you went and like tried to change your whole entire system from the ground up, you would probably have tanks rolling into your country if you did that. Um, I don't know. I don't think anyone would invade the NATO member state, but um, it, maybe in a third world probably. If you presented enough of a threat to foreign capital, they would. They would, know, well, they would, they would just... try lower level things like uh, possibly assassination, uh, funding opposition groups, 
uh, something like uh, the National Endowment for Democracy to come in and interfere in elections and the political process, etc. But as a last resort, there, there, there would be a military. In- I mean, I, I would agree with a country like Ukraine. They actually tried that with a, well, a president that was uh, anti-Russian, if I remember correctly. They, they tried to assassinate him with poison. And he went to a hospital and they said it's nothing and his condition got worse. Well, what, do you know the guy that I'm talking about? Was a couple uh, of thick. Poroshenko? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, Poroshenko. Yeah. yeah, I think that's who it was. Yeah. Yeah, and then uh, you know when when Ukraine didn't play ball, they the, the Russians uh, intervened. But I I don't think it would happen to a NATO country. I'm sorry, I will just not be able to to accept this uh, type of politics going on, because the, the thing with NATO is it's a paper tiger, and they need to act like um, you know every nation is being protected because otherwise there's no need for a NATO. And I think the Americans invested too much cash in order to just allow tanks to come into a NATO country. Yeah, to a, a to a degree, uh, the same thing is done in Canada here. For example, uh, Canada holds um, two thirds of the world's uh, fresh water resources, uh, fresh water mm. reserves, and Nestle and Coke are coming in and signing deals where they can just take as much fresh water basically as they want, and they're just gonna, they're just, just going to plunder the shit out of us. And, of course, our dumbass leaders are just sitting there letting them do it. And even writing things into contracts saying, once we let them start doing it, we can't stop them from doing it. People in the chat want you to say the top three reason you hate capitalism. The inequality that leads to the destruction of, of the third world. Uh, in general, I fucking hate money. I, <laughs> you hate money. I fucking hate it. To be to be fair, it's not money I hate, but money relations. Hmm. So what people are willing to do for money, basically? It's not just that, and then your 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 social status being dependent upon how much money you have, etc. Stuff like that. Well, and and the third reason. Um. That's kind of for these. Legit. These are the two reasons that are strong enough for you to... Yeah, that's strong enough. I mean, the way I view money, in a, in a very simplistic term, is how my economic professor said it. It's like, um, if you go and you help you mow your neighbor's lawn, he will then you know reward you for doing that with, let's say, $10. And then when you go to the store to buy something, let's say candy, he will ask you, well, did you help your fellow man today? And you say yes. And he goes like, well, prove it. And you show him the proof by presenting the ten dollar bill, which is why he gives you um, the the fruits of your labor, which now are going to be into whatever you want. You know, somebody should tell uh, Martin Schick really that because you have a you know a whole system that's very predatory to that degree. Well, I I, I mean that's a very way... simplistic you know that's a very simplistic. Uh, well, it is, it is a very simplistic explanation for, for a YouTube channel, you know, with, example. With people that it's, it's probably don't study example. economics. But, um, I, I mean, the, the, the way I view money as being positive is that it rewards people who succeed and it gives you a, an extra incentive to, to be successful. Like the way I view it, if there was no reward um, and I would have to choose between becoming a doctor and becoming a janitor and they would both be rewarded the same. I wouldn't take being a doctor because it comes with more responsibility. You can fuck up, you can you know, uh, hurt a person for life or you can end up killing someone. While being a janitor, you just go to work, you do your job and you come home. There's, there's no uh, additional difficulty to it. So I, if it I'd was- I'd be very suspicious of a doctor who was just there to get paid. But he's not just there to get paid, right? But the financial incentive is also an extra bonus. Well, like for that, instance, that's not a problem in Cuba. They have more doctors per capita than just about but they're very else. poor doctors uh, let's yes. be honest like, no, no, I can... they're not they're, they're not they're not poor doctors well I, I can show you reports if you want where Cuban doctors are going to the third world and they're just there to push um, Cuban ideology and they're, and they're there to oh I'm, uh, sure, I'm sure they push ideology but that doesn't make them bad doctors well no but the people who are receiving them also say that they're not very qualified like most of them aren't even doctors they're just trained ideologues and and they know like some I basic mean, medicine. That, that kind of sounds like bullshit. Well, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry. Uh, I can Cuban show you medical schools are very highly them. rated. So, I mean, I, I I could show you the articles, and you you can talk about it on your channel and disagree with them if you want. Um, give me three reasons why I should fall in line with communism. 
I'm a filthy fan sitter, says Jay. Uh, if you're in the first world, there basically there isn't going to be one. I mean, I could make a moral argument all you want. I could point out how things would be better, but in the end, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it anyway. Mm. It's it's would like, you like it's like asking the capitalist class to just give up their power. Well, they're not they're not going to do it. Yeah, and I think this is when the people at Frankfurt School realized this and said, "Well, why not use race rather than?" Oh God, I hate the Frankfurt class. School. <laughs> you hate the Frankfurt School. Everyone hates the Frankfurt School. Everyone should yeah. hate them. They're shit. Yeah, but think about it, right? If the West becomes um, corrupted from the inside, if they start uh, having all these crises going on due to uh, progressivism, then people might start wanting communism. It's basically an admission of failure. They know the first world's not revolutionary, so they're not pushing class anymore. They're pushing this, or they're pushing that, or they're pushing gender identity. Yeah, you're, so, not, so let's you're, make... you're not pushing class because you know there's no revolutionary potential. And then if I turn around and say there's no the, – the revolutionary potential is next to nothing, then they get mad at you. Oh, what the fuck? You're being reactionary. You can't say that. Yeah, but that. think about no, this No, dude, way, right? it's true. Every, you're every... basically confirming what I'm saying is being true. Every single corporation that starts uh, pandering to this ideology, every single corporation that is embracing diversity and what you have you, they're starting to fail economically. So if you're going to have all of this and you also have race riots and like, you know, that you have in Baltimore and Ferguson, but you start getting them even more, eventually the first world is going to start doing really poorly economically. Right? Like, it, for, for it, instance, it, it, for very, me, it very well could collapse. And, and then, yeah, it problems. could collapse. Absolutely. And then you have the revolutionary potential. You'll have it there. But I think the question is, it's not just a matter of having a potential. You also have to have the organization set up to carry it out. And right now in the U.S., there is no, there's no organization set up to carry that out. Like if it, if, yeah. if society fell tomorrow, it it wouldn't go socialist because the, there's no, there's no one there to take up that role. Hmm. I mean, no, I I agree with you. Um. Well, I guess do, do you want to discuss about life under communism, or um, should we end it here? It's up to you. No, we 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 can end it here. Okay. Well, I, I really thank you for coming on this chat. Um, I think this was a very interesting conversation, hearing a different perspective. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you're pointing out that people in the first world um, don't have the revolutionary potential. Because this is what I've been trying to say on, on my chat all the time. It's like, I, I made like five videos and I said, I don't understand the point in trying to lecture America to just give away their lifestyle for the third world. And I, I'm one of the people that really don't care about the third world, honestly. I No, they I, really yeah. don't. But yeah. I, I don't care either, right? I, I care about myself, my well-being, my family, my friends. Um, and, and the way I view it is if my country, for instance, would stop taking resources from the third world, another nation would. I think it's up to the third world to fix their shit. Yeah, it, it's, it is up to the uh, – we advocate a pan-third world uh, movement to liberate themselves from imperialism. The, the the problem with the third world is corruption, right? That that's what they need to do. They need to start saying no. Um, but until that happens, you're going to have things like Zimbabwe, like South Africa, and uh, other nations. Uh, anyway, okay. Uh, you want to say something else? Oh no, I was just going to say it's it's less about corruption and more about uh, puppets that are being put in by the West. But in in either case, yeah, corruption would 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 be a problem. Okay. So thank you all guys for watching. Thank you for listening to this and uh, we'll see you later. See ya. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.